a lead off from Hannah Stern, our General Secretary this morning, who will give us, I'm sure, uh, an interesting and powerful overview of where we are in the UK and, uh, and hopefully, uh, as we see from this afternoon, where we're going in the afternoon. So I'll hand over to Hannah. Please, if you could make sure that you're on mute during Hannah's lead off. Um, and then after she's finished speaking, I will, I'll invite people in um, to speak and to comment once she's actually completed her lead off. Lead off. So op over to you, Hannah. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Daniel, for that excellent introduction. First the music and then a really good speech to start us off. Um, and I congratulate you all. First of all, I don't know what the weather's like in the southwest, but in London, the sun is shining. So you're all doing pretty good to be in another Zoom meeting when you could be outside, maybe selling the socialist in the sun. Uh, but you've made the right decision because this is a really important conference that you've got today for the reasons that Daniel has outlined. Um, I'm mainly going to talk about events in Britain, but I think just to start with, I need to put it in a little bit of a world context, because of course, what takes place in Britain is also related to the developments for capitalism worldwide. And the pandemic is still ravaging the globe. Here things have eased a little bit. But if you look at the situation in Brazil, for example, it's an absolute nightmare. And there's a number of other countries where that is the case. But nonetheless, I think it will be true to say that globally, the capitalist classes of the world are more frightened about what they are going to face beyond the pandemic, even than the nightmare that they're facing during the pandemic, because they understand as the Financial Times put it in an editorial kind of mid pandemic, they said they were worried that this pandemic was going to bring socialism on its coattails. And there's two reasons that they said that. The first was they understand that the scale of government intervention that has taken place in the course of the last year, really in all of the rich countries of the world. If you take Britain, for example, then this Tory government has spent two and a half times in one year the amount that Corbyn proposed to spend in one year in his 2019 manifesto. They've spent unprecedented amounts of cash outside of wartime. Now, of course, they've done that to prop up the capitalist system, to give money to their cronies rather than to benefit the majority. But nonetheless, the capitalists understand that that will raise workers' appetites and make it much harder for Tory governments, as they are clearly going to and already are, to say in the future, no money for the NHS, there's no money for your pension, there's no money for pay rises for public sector workers, because people know when you need to find the money, the money is there. There is, from that point of view, a magic money tree. So that's one of the things that the Financial Times was worrying about. But the other, of course, is that the pandemic has accelerated all the underlying crises of capitalism, and it has revealed to literally billions of people around the world that capitalism as a system does not work and led to beginning to look for an alternative. Now, the anger that has built up during this pandemic has not yet been fully expressed. Really, it's hardly been expressed at all as yet. And that's no surprise. People's consciousness, their outlook, always lags behind objective reality. But particularly during a pandemic, when everybody has been focused on getting through, on looking after their friends, their families, their own health, worrying about losing their jobs, being stuck at home, being unable to discuss with other people in many cases, not only society has been locked down, but class struggle has largely been locked down as well. And we, by the way, have done extremely well. I know it's the topic of this afternoon's discussion, but we have done extremely well as a party to have managed to not just hold together through those difficult times, which of course are difficult for all of us as individual Socialist Party members as well, but more than that, to actually build and strengthen the Socialist Party during the pandemic. But as the pandemic comes to an end, and there is a certain comparison with the end of a war here, 
we are likely to see enormous explosions of struggle as people begin to express all of the anger that has accumulated during the pandemic. And the capitalist class globally have some understanding of that. That's why they're frightened. It's the single biggest factor in the decision of the new US president, Biden, to not repeat what capitalism globally did after the 2007-2008 economic crisis, where as soon as they could, they switched to austerity, but this time to introduce a big stimulus package in the $1.9 trillion that he uh, and his uh, uh, presidency have implemented. After 40 years of wage stagnation, over 140 million Americans were already living in poverty before the pandemic began. And the pandemic made it far worse. There were 50 million Americans unable to feed themselves and their families in the course of the pandemic. And there is enormous anger in US society. And the Biden presidency and the capitalist class can see what's coming. They've had a glimpse with the Black Lives Matter protests on the one hand, and of course they've erupted again after two more brutal police killings in the course uh, of the last few weeks. That on the one hand, but also Trump's base on the other hand, shows from the capitalist class the instability base and the revolts in all kinds of direct uh, in, in all uh, kinds uh, of directions, and that is why. Far from it being something that the capitalist class oppose, the majority of the US capitalist class are fully in favor of Biden's bailout. 71% um, of chief executives agree with it. Even though they're worried it might be inflationary, they're too frightened of what's coming to worry about that because what they're hoping is that this will act to kickstart growth, to put some money, and it will put some money in the pockets of US workers, and therefore not just shore up the social base of the Democrats, but more fundamentally than that, shore up the base of US capitalism against the revolts that are coming. Now, it's been compared, this deal in the US, with the New Deal in the 1930s. It's not yet on that scale. What's been agreed so far is much smaller and the, what's been agreed so far is also short-term cash measures. I mean, of course, you can't afford to feed your family. You get a cheque for over $1,000 through the post or into your bank account, you're going to be happy about it. I'm not suggesting it won't make workers happy. But at the same time, it's not any longer-term change in their living conditions. It's short-term cash measures. Even the introduction of a federal $15 an hour minimum wage was dropped from the final package. Beyond that, Biden is now trying to get agreed an infrastructure package, which would have longer term consequences. But how big that is, what it finally ends up is, uh, as and what its consequences are, is still not clear. But even with the current package, for all its limitations, it is going to have a number of consequences. First of all, actually, it's likely to increase the confidence of the US working class to fight back. In a way, one of the most important things about it, which is a comparison with the New Deal in the 30s, is that Biden is being forced to make, talk words about it being a good idea to join a trade union. And this is at a time when trade union membership is very low in the US, but notwithstanding the recent defeat of the ballot to try and get unionization in the Amazon plant in Alabama, it's the case that a big majority of workers in the US are in favor of trade unions. The latest survey show about 66% of workers would like to be a member of a trade union. You have your president, even if it's just rhetoric, saying, yes, join a trade union. That is gonna give workers confidence to join trade unions and potentially, uh, to, uh, potentially to fight back. It will also have economic consequences, certainly increasing short-term growth in the US. And given its size in the world economy and also the recovery of the number two in the world, China, we're likely to see an increase in global growth figures, even while Europe and the neo-colonial world continue to languish. But what it is not going to do 
is create stability for US capitalism domestically or prevent a new phase of economic crises. On the contrary, by the way, even the New Deal in the 1930s didn't do that, and this certainly won't. There are numerous ways that a new crisis could develop, possibly without any real gap between the current crisis that we're in and a new one. You can't say on timing exactly both the US and global capitalism. There are enormous speculative bubbles on the stock markets, not least in the US. There are gigantic levels of indebtedness globally of governments, but also of private corporations and of course of individuals. One of the reasons that the big package that Biden's implementing is considered likely to have relatively moderate effects for workers and for then their spending on buying new goods and pushing the economy forward is because they're so in debt that up to two thirds of it is estimated could be spent paying the rent they own, paying the mortgage they own, paying off their credit cards rather than being able to go out and spend new money. What that means is while there may be no prospect or not a likely prospect in a way inflation in the short term, it can have some inflationary consequences what's being done. And even small increases in inflation leading to increases in interest rates would have devastating effects on the world economy generally and specifically on the situation for many workers. The prospect of stagflation, which existed in the 70s, of economic crisis combined with inflation is something that is a real possibility in the coming period. And of course, another trigger, without wanting to spend too long on the world economy, for a new phase of economic crisis is all the different geopolitical crises that can erupt and can then have an economic effect. Unlike Trump's quixotic uh, nationalist isolationist approach, under Biden, US imperialism is back. Of course, that's the same US imperialism that bought us Iraq, Afghanistan, the Vietnam Wars. It's not, you know, we didn't like Trump, but it doesn't mean it's a good thing that US imperialism is back. And actually, it's the same, but it's not quite the same. Not because Biden is a more progressive figure, he's acting in the interests of US imperialism, but because US imperialism today is much weaker, its power has declined in the intervening decades. So for at the moment, for example, he, Biden is trying to build a coalition of Western powers against growing the growing power of China. He's attempting to do that, but it is extremely difficult for him, given the decline of US imperialism and that China is now responsible for about 18% of the global economy. What we face is a prolonged period of crisis between the different major capitalist powers. Whereas in the past, for a whole period, US imperialism was the dominant power and it could tell the rest of the world what to do. And that led, in a sense, to a kind of stability. Not that what they said was good, but it created a framework within which the other capitalist powers operated. Today, the US remains the world's biggest power, but it is not strong enough to tell the rest of the world what to do. And so instead, you see an increasingly crisis and conflict-ridden world where, yes, world war is not on the agenda, global conflicts are not on the agenda, and generally the different major capitalist powers try to prevent war. But in their jostling for position, you see all kinds of military buildup and the possibility of different proxy wars, wars where the different imperialist powers are backing local regional powers. You can see it taking place around the Ukraine at the moment, possibly, uh, which can then also have economic as well as social consequences. So in this very unstable and crisis ridden world in which coups, wars and revolutionary uprisings are going to be more and more likely, what are the prospects for puny British capitalism, which is a third rate power in all of this, 
and is you know unable to take an independent position from the major players in these conflicts. Well, whatever the limits on Biden's stimulus package, it stands in sharp contrast to the plans of this Tory government. Really, their plans are twofold. On the one hand, they economically intend to rely entirely on the continued rollout of the vaccine. They hope, and we all hope, of course, to limit hospitalisation and death in any third wave, and therefore to fuel economic recovery. And look, let's be clear, having suffered the deepest recession in 300 years, we are now going to see economic recovery. There is a section of society, those who've kept their jobs and have been stuck at home for a year, and have not been members of the Socialist Party, so have not been able to donate their savings to the fighting fund, who have accumulated savings, approximately 100 billion, it's estimated, in the course of the last year. And as the shops open, they're going to enjoy splashing some cash, buying some stuff, hoping perhaps even to go on holiday. Even for those workers, that section who are doing going to be feeling like they're doing OK for a little bit, and will have some effect on helping the economy to recover, they haven't got a pay rise. They've just not been able to spend all of their wages for the course of the last year. And on the contrary to getting a pay rise, they are facing continued pay restraint. Even the Office for Budget Responsibility, which is really a government quango that works out uh, perspectives for the economy, they estimate that even with no further health or economic crisis, so we go into a recovery now that keeps powering on till 2024, it's not exactly going to power because they estimate that by 2024, the economy will still be 3% below its pre-crisis trend and real earnings will be 4.3% below their pre-crisis trend. That's 1,200 pounds a year on average that workers will have less than they would have had without the pandemic. And we know that if the government gets its way, that's not just a question of the private sector pay squeezes, but it's also the austerity for public sector workers with the pay freeze for all public sector workers, except health workers who get a poxy 1% rise, which of course both in real terms are pay cuts. So given all of that, Johnson is deluding himself if he imagines that working class people are going to forgive him for everything they've suffered in the last year and everything that they're going to suffer just because they get to spend a little bit of money in the shops in the course of the next month or two. And of course, it's only one section of the working class that is going to get to spend a little bit of money on the shop or in the shops because the other strand of Johnson's strategy is to inflict post-COVID austerity on the working class. We see that with the announcements on public sector pay, but already we've seen leaps in unemployment. Two thirds of the jobs that have gone were held by young people. This year is the 40th anniversary of the Brixton riots. At that stage, black youth unemployment was 41%. It is again today. The numbers of young black people without a job are as high now as they were in the early 1980s. And far from introducing further stimuluses like Biden is doing to help with that situation, of course, Johnson is planning to end the furlough, which will lead to a new hike in unemployment at the same time as he cuts universal credit by 20 uh, pounds a week already. There are millions in dire poverty. They are going to be pushed into destitution. And alongside the public sector and what the government is doing is what the private sector bosses are doing, who of course are taking advantage of the pandemic to try and push things further in their direction. There are numerous examples of attempts at higher and re uh, higher, fire and rehire, get it the right way around. But of course, British gas, and what they've done, it is the biggest mass layoff that has taken place in decades with them laying off those workers who've refused to sign the new contracts 
the union is continuing to struggle, but it is a sign of the general brutality in the workplaces that is developing in the period that we're going into. Now, in reality, Johnson knows he is not going to be able to ride all of that on a sea of popularity. He's not going to be loved. He knows there are going to be massive protests against what the bosses and his government are doing. And really, that's what lies behind the police and crime bill. It's the idea of beefing up the state in order to prepare to try and make it easier to stop the protests that are coming. It won't work. In fact, as the protests against the bill itself have shown, which have drawn together young people who have been involved in all kinds of other protests to unite against this repressive piece of legislation, it will have the opposite effect. It will actually act as a certain whip of counter-revolution, uh, 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 particularly because it's not just that we're in misery and everybody's in misery. There's a section of society who really have done very well indeed out of the pandemic. I don't mean workers who've got a little bit of savings. I mean the fact that the UK billionaires have increased their wealth by a third in the course of the pandemic. And of course, as is being revealed, day by day, Johnson's government has had its trouts, his sna their snouts thoroughly in the trough of the riches that are sloshing around. The Green Seal scandal, Johnson has tried to distance himself from because he's got this idea he can have a populist appeal, but the, he's not really the Tory party. He's something new standing up for the little people against the old guard of the Tory party. And so when the Greensill scandal, scandal first started to break, there were Tory MPs joining in the attacks on Cameron in the hope of trying to give the idea, this is nothing to do with us, Gov, this was the old regime. There is not a cat's chance in hell of them getting away with that idea. Not when Hancock's family firm, owned by his sister, the health minister, have been revealed to have won a whole series of NHS contracts. Not when the man appointed by Johnson to oversee the Greensill inquiry is on the board of a private bank owned by one of the largest donors to the Tory party and staffed by a whole series of ex-senior civil servants. I mean, honestly, what a blatant stitch up. And that is not going to be lost on people. This scandal actually, potentially even more than the MPs expensive, expenses scandal 11 or 12 years ago, re reveals that it's not only a question of the Tory party or of individual politicians, but that the supposedly neutral capitalist state, first of all, defends the interests of the capitalist class, but also the individuals that are part of it are blatantly lining their own pockets while they do so. And we have to use this scandal to draw out those points and to demand every possible reform to make parliament more democratic and for MPs to be held to account. Some of the demands that we highlighted at the time of the MPs expenses scandal, of all MPs to be paid a worker's wage, for them to be subject to recall at any time, for biannual elections to parliament and so on, we have to bring to the fore again, linked to a programme for the socialist transformation of society. But of course, what's key is we have to raise that the working class needs its own party and that Labour is not that. And actually, this business, in a way, hammers that home again, because contrast to this cosy little inquiry into Cameron with what's taken place in Liverpool, where in Liverpool, there were allegations of corruption against the Liverpool ex-Liverpool mayor. The Tory minister, himself just a year ago, up to his eyes in a corruption scandal relating to property developers, has gone into Liverpool, 
and not just sent in unelected Tory uh, appointed commissioners to a city that hasn't had a Tory council in 50 years, but has also slashed democracy, cutting the number of councillors by two thirds. Of course, and, and what have Labour done? Labour are not drawing the contrast between that and what's taking place with Greensill because they backed what's happened in Liverpool to the hilt. They supported what the Tory government has done. Of course, at the same time as they themselves undemocratically ruled out the only candidate who supported Jeremy Corbyn, who was trying to get selected to be the mayor of Liverpool. Now look, at the moment, the Tories have been ahead in the polls. That may actually change as a result of these scandals. We have to see the consequence of the Greensill scandal. But up until this point, the Tories have been ahead in the polls while Starmer has plunged. And that is not as a result of the vaccine. I mean, of course, millions of people are happy to have had the vaccine. But the idea that that means they now love the Tory party, that's nonsense. The reason that the Tories have been ahead in the opinion polls is because of Starmer. You're unceasing. Since he's been elected, his central drive has been to prove to the capitalist class that Labour is once again a reliable representative of their interests by annihilating Corbynism. Corbynism. And from that point of view, he's been pretty successful. The problem is, it's not electorally popular. You don't win support from working class people by doing what he has done in the course of the last year. Look, even on the question of the vaccine, in an unguarded moment, Johnson said that it was capitalist greed that was responsible for the success of the vaccine. Then he tried to turn it into a joke because he knew how unpopular it would be to have said that. Because of course, in reality, the pharmaceutical companies have been given £11 billion by the UK government alone to fund the development of the vaccine. And yet they insist on keeping the intellectual property rights to the formula for the vaccine and to not allow it to be handed out to the neo-colonial world in order to be able to produce the vaccine cheaply. Even when it's obvious to anybody that you cannot solve the problem of this virus on a national basis, it has to be done globally or it's not going to work. If Starmer was to stay, these people are just interested in protecting their profits and to call for the nationalisation of the pharmaceutical industry under democratic working class control and management, he would soar ahead in the polls on the basis of that policy alone. But of course, you can no more imagine that happening than you can imagine pigs flying. I mean, it's just never going to happen. Peter Mandelson, the Blairite Prince of Darkness, is now back as an advisor to Starmer, and he's called for a policy review to jettison all of Corbyn's left policies and to introduce realistic policies, as uh, Mandelson would put it. But actually, it's not necessary. They don't need a policy review because they're doing it piecemeal. Look at the question, for example, of the nationalisation of BT's open reach to provide free broad broadband to the country, a policy which is unanswerably correct after the last year. And yet when Starmer's asked about it, all he has ever said is that he will have a solution that is friendly to big business. And he just keeps repeating that. What does that mean other than I've jumped this, there is no way I am gonna nationalize BT open reach. Look at their response to the police and crime bill. They were going to abstain until the brutality against the Sarah Everhard vigil got on the front pages of the papers and embarrassed them into deciding to vote against it. In your region, the mayor of Bristol would claim to be a relatively left representative of the Labour Party. Yet what was his response to the police brutality against the first big demonstration against the police and crime bill? He went on the radio and attacked the demonstrators. Now you could say maybe he wasn't on the demonstration so he'd only seen the tabloid coverage so he had a wrong idea of what had taken place and he thought that it was the demonstrators that attacked the police. But honestly that's not an excuse 
Not least because why wasn't he on the demonstration? They claim to be opposed to the bill. If they were serious about that, if they actually were a workers' party, they would have mobilised thousands of people from the whole of the Labour movement to attend that demonstration, to organise democratically controlled stewarding to help protect that demonstration from possible attack by the police, instead of which he washed his hands and blamed the, blame, uh, blamed the demonstrators. And that is a reflection of the pro-capitalist role that Labour is playing now. Um, and we do not have, you know, there's an enormous vacuum at this stage because Corbynism was defeated. Finally, at the same time as the pa pandemic took a grip in society, and therefore there is no, nobody can see a step towards solving, providing a working class political representation at this point in time. And that will have an effect on events that develop post pandemic. It's had an effect on the class struggle during the pandemic. Because if you look what took place in the trade union movement, at the tops of the trade unions at the start of the pandemic, there was really a universal collapse into national unity, into we've got no choice but to support the government. We have to put our workers' demands to one side. And a factor in that with the more left-wing trade union leaders is they were demoralized by the defeat of Corbynism and they were in disarray and they just gave in to that pressure. Now, in the course of the pandemic, that's changed a bit. We don't want to give the idea that's a fixed position because under pressure from below, some of the trade unions have been forced to take quite important action, but it has been under pressure from below. Take the education union, the NEU, for example, which would be considered a relatively left-led trade union. In November last year, our one member at that stage of the NEU's executive moved a motion to prepare for national action over health and safety, and she got no support. Just six weeks later, 400,000 workers attended an online NEU meeting to discuss taking action at the beginning of January, which then, of course, forced the government into a screeching U-turn over those issues. So the union was forced to act, but it wasn't its initial position. It was under pressure from below that it moved in that direction. And a big part of our role in the Socialist Party in the coming period is to continue to act, to organize in the trade unions and to force trade union leaders to take action, but also to fight for the election of representatives of the trade unions, uh, of representatives, trade union leaders worthy of their members. Now, the negative effects of the defeat of Corbynism have undoubtedly been worsened by the approach that Corbyn and also the left trade union leaders have taken to the question uh, uh, in the course of the last year. Because frankly, you know, in our view, the, the defeat wasn't preordained. If they behaved differently, events would have played out differently. But even after the defeat, unfortunately, their attitude up until now has largely been, let's keep our heads down and hope that this goes away. Yes, we'll take legal action, but we will do nothing outside the parameters of the Labour Party because we want the witch hunt to stop and we just think we need to stay quiet. It's like rabbits in headlights. Unfortunately, the whole history of the last five years shows that the pro-capitalist forces in the Labour Party, who now have its decisively in their grip, will never stop if you stay quiet. Weakness invites aggression and it's only led them to go further on the attack. But it's also increased the disarray and confusion by those who previously looked to Corbynism. We've raised, for example, imagine if Jeremy Corbyn had been prepared to stand as a Labour, as an MP in London, as an independent for the mayor of London in the elections taking place on the 6th of May. Like Ken Livingstone before him, he could have won that contest as an independent. And if he'd stood on his 2019 election programme, that would have galvanised and enthused the supporters of Corbynism, not just in London, but across the country. But of course, he's not been prepared to do so. 
So another important part of our tasks in the Socialist Party in the coming period is raising at every stage demands that will step, take steps towards solving the crisis of working class political representation, continuing to put demands on Jeremy Corbyn, but more importantly, actually, on the left trade union leaders, that they should take steps to allow their members to begin to contest elections. And it means being prepared to be critical of even the better people. So for example, there's a Unite General Secretary election about to be called. There are supposedly three left candidates in that General Secretary election. One of them, Steve Turner, is the official left candidate. All you need to know about him is that the Blairites are demanding that the official Blairite candidate stands down for Steve Turner. That tells you all you need to know about him. He is not a left candidate in reality. But there are two left candidates, and part of our job is to campaign to try and make sure there's only one, but also to criticise both of them, because they both have good qualities, but they epitomise the failure to address the question of political representation that is taking place at the moment. One of them, Sharon Graham, takes an almost anti-political stand. Never mind all the politicians, they're all the same. Almost like that. But the other, Howard Beckett, is fighting, but fighting entirely inside the Labour Party and even calling on people to join the Labour Party. So we have to put demands on all of these people, but of course we also have to show what is possible. And that's what we're doing with the trade unionist and socialist coalition. It's an important means to act as a bit of a lever on history, to push history forward a little bit. It involves relatively modest forces, but it does have the official backing of a national trade union with 80,000 members, the Transport Workers Union, the RMT. And let's be clear, when we first approached the RMT to say, let's start standing in elections again, we didn't necessarily expect to win the argument because there were many forces in the RMT would be rather we weren't standing in elections. But when push came to shove, a majority of their executive looked at Starmer and thought, how have we got any choice? We're not sure how big Tusk is gonna be. We're not sure how far it's gonna go, but we have to support, support standing against these people. And as a result, Tusk has now gained some important momentum, as you will all know, with a, a range of ex-Labour Party members, trade union activists coming on board and standing in these elections. The votes we'll get will be quite modest, no doubt, but they will act to put pressure on the trade union leaders to take steps themselves towards beginning to give working class people a political voice, but also to put pressure on the Labour right. I know I need to wind up, I think, in a minute, but I'll just make this point. You don't only put pressure on the Labour right wing by winning elections, much as we like to win elections. You also do it by standing and fighting for your programme. And it's worth looking back to the prehistory of the Labour Party, when it first began fighting to give a voice for working class people. You could say the first real step forward, it was for the LRC, was in the 1906 general election. They didn't win that general election. I think they got 4.5% of the vote nationally. But they put pressure on the incoming Liberal government. And one of its first acts was to repeal a vicious piece of anti-trade union law, the Taft Vale judgment. And they didn't do that because they were nice people. It was a pro-big business government. They did it because they felt the hot breath of the working class on their necks as a result of the LRC stand. And we aim with Tusk to put a little bit of the hot breath of the working class on the backs of the Labour right wing. So we have an important job to do in Tusk, but it's not our most important job. We have to expect all kinds of struggles to develop in the coming months. And the lack of a clear lead been given, the absence of a mass workers party, but also the lack of a clear lead from the trade unions means that those struggles can erupt in all kinds of unexpected directions and sometimes dissipate again. 
Some will be more sustained. It's clear the question of the battle for independence in Scotland, for example, is going to be a major feature of the work of our comrades in Scotland. There can be all kinds of class struggles erupting, struggles amongst young people and so on. We have to do our best to be present in all of those movements and to put forward a programme to take them forward. But our most important job is finding in all of those movements, the workers and young people who just as the Financial Times feared, have looked at this pandemic and thought capitalism doesn't work, we need another solution and are looking towards socialist ideas. Even during a pandemic, 450 people, probably a few of you in this room today, have joined the Socialist Party on Zoom. We now have an opportunity to get out to meet some of you for the first time, but also to meet much broader sections of the working class and young people who are looking for socialist ideas and recruit them to our party. And that is our most important task because that will ensure that we are a strong enough force to not just intervene in, but to play a decisive role in the major struggles that are going to develop in the coming years. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Hannah. Fantastic. Isn't it great that we've actually got a socialist road to the map?